Robert Smigel is here. Again, we just so, showed a clip of Leo, which has set a record for 34.6 million views in the first six days, the biggest debut ever for a Netflix animated film, and Robert Smigel, the co-director oh, yeah. and co-writer. And you also wrote the the songs for this as I well? I did write the songs. I did. That make the whole world sing? I'm sorry. I just went, <laughs> I just went Manilow on you right there. I, yeah, no, I'm, I have a lot of Manilow in me. But People is this the first time it. you've done that? or are you? Or, no, 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 actually. I okay. Wrote, I wrote Christmas Time for the Jews on <laughs> Saturday Night Live many years ago. And I wrote, uh, well, Triumph had an entire album that is, was Grammy nominated, believe it or not. Damn straight it was. With songs like Underage B. Sean, recounting a <laughs> regrettable incident where he thought the dog was a year old. The dog was only 10 months old. Regrettable. <laughs> regrettable. <laughs> But, you know, he opened up and, you know, it was a very raw, honest album. What were some of the other songs on the Triumph well, album? Well, there's one about cats and I can't repeat the, I can't repeat the title of that one. Uh, another one about Benji. I, I can't repeat the title of that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, but the point is, yes, Grammy nominated album. Yes. The point is, Grammy nominated. When it all boils down, yeah, it's I Grammy mean, nominated. Yes, you know, back come, in the come day. Come poop with me is the come name. poop with come me. The Thank name you. Of the album. Ah, come poop with me. Because you're looking for it on streaming. Is that a Sinatra? On streaming. Is that an homage yes, to Sinatra? Of course, of course. Uh, Triumphs even got like the jacket and the uh, fedora on his head <laughs> he on the does. cover with uh, two you know? two young poodles. Yes, like some very hot young poodles. Yep. yep. Do you want it's some other like, uh, track sure, names? Sure, please. Keep yeah. going, keep going. What of else course. you got? What uh, else let's you got? See. Uh, uh, you well, can see. Can you can read. Can I read? 30 Seconds of Magic? Yes, that's about sex <laughs> with <laughs> Triumph. That's a, a love groove. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a call to a Chinese restaurant. Uh, uh, yeah, that's something that uh, I would get canceled for yeah, today. Okay, very good. Uh, you have to work blue. That's the you longest have to track work blue. Seven yeah, because they always say you don't work blue, but this right. Triumph sang a song about how you have to work blue. Okay. Uh, my Mama. Ooh, that's a really filthy song. <laughs> uh, uh, it seems like this could be a tribute to someone who just passed away. Bob Barker is the name Bob of Bob Barker. Oh, yes, yeah. that is an angry diatribe about um, Bob Barker, the most evil man in the world, in Triumph's <laughs> mind because of the oh, we're, all we're, the we're, testicle we're, chopping. <laughs> <laughs> Have your pets neutered? He just yeah, yeah, that echoes in his head oh, at the beginning of the song. That, huh? Yes, yes. Uh, Jack uh, Black. It's a duet with Jack Black. Is that correct? correct? I can't believe I'm here and I'm selling a 20 year old no, album. I know, but it's great because this is, I would say, uh, and for everyone to know, Leo, much more family friendly. Much more family friendly, and all the songs are family friendly. It's beautiful, yes. man. I mean, Thank uh, you. you're very, very welcome. You know, it, 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 it's just, um, and it's, it's just, a, it, it just strikes a really neat chord. I appreciate that. You're welcome. It's like I hope people don't think, you know, I'm older now, and maybe like, oh, what's he doing, selling out, writing? Like, come on, this is my life now. I have like 15 year old boys. They were, they were in like fourth grade when I started writing this movie. So. Is that you right? Know, you yeah. The word, when you said you've been working on this for this oh long. Oh my God, really? yeah. Like fifth grade they were in. Yeah, so that's what? literally, I started it in like 2018. And um, a lot of the movie has stuff from my life and my kids' life. And my boys are in the movie too. Oh, congrats actually. on that. They just, um, they, they read the scratch vocals like when we were just putting in anybody. And then Adam was like, you got to keep them in the movie, pal. That's <laughs> And I was like, really? Happy yeah. damage you. So, oh my gosh. It, yeah. It, it, they're good kids. They don't want to be actors. They have much more realistic aspirations. It's about the last they year. Want, they want to be NBA stars. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> the last year of elementary school is seen through the eyes of a class pet. The yes. uh, jaded, if you will, 74 year old lizard uh, Leo, played by Adam Sandler. Yes, and his. His partner in the terrarium is a turtle named Bill, played by Bill Burr. He was here just a couple of weeks ago. Oh. We were talking about it with him. Yeah. 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 Smigel's a pain in the ass to work with, but it's worth it. <laughs> he, he, he said he loved doing it. That's for he sure. Did. Yeah, no, he's great. He loves to bust your uh, cojones. He certainly when he's, does. Uh, when he's uh, working. He... And I imagine the lizard character was Sandler's from Jump, right? In your mind, pretty much? Oh, well, no. So Adam, no. Adam had the idea to do a, a movie about fifth grade and the transitional anxiety that comes with going from elementary school to middle school. Okay. And he started working on a script with Paul Sato, but it was a totally different story 
And um, I pulled a couple of things from it, like the drone idea mm-hmm. and the uh, kindergartners that are really funny in there. But but um, my idea was to have like, you know, the class pet who's like just really jaded and has seen every kid. He's been in this room for mm-hmm. like 70 years. He's seen every kind of fifth grader. He pegs the kids and he's really cynical. And then he realizes that he's going to die or at least believes it from overhearing something. And then he decides he's got to make more of his life. So he tries to escape when a kid takes him home for the weekend. He mm-hmm. gets caught. He has, and that's the girl. He has a conversation with her and ends up solving a problem based on all of his expertise from looking at kids for 70 years. And eventually he keeps trying to escape, but eventually realizes he has more satisfaction in helping these kids. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. That's so great. Robert Smigel here on the Rich Eisen show. Everybody should check out Leo on Netflix, which is available right here on Roku. When was the first time you met Sandler? Oh, well I got to, I was a, I was a co-producer at Saturday Night Live yep. after about three or four years. And so I would get to go to Chicago every summer. Lauren would want to scout people. Mm-hmm. And so one year we got to see Chris Farley do the motivational speaker sketch oh at, Saturday, at uh, Second City. That's where he did it? Yeah, That's Bob where... Odenkirk wrote the original version, and Bob was in the show too. Oh, okay. And uh, he played Phil Hartman's part, and Chris, yeah, he just... That was the easiest hire I think Lauren's ever made. Done in his life. Like seeing, he just seeing Farley do the you know van the, down yeah, by the river and just all that. Five business. minutes of Farley, you just know this guy is a superstar, right? And um, and then uh, we went to watch uh, Adam, Chris, Rock. Um, they both auditioned as stand-ups at the Improv in Chicago, uh-huh. and so that's when I met him. I just kind of said hi briefly. He was very nervous. He had a sort of a very, uh, you know, his his stand up. He was very meek. It was like a conscious choice on his part. He was almost right. doing a character. Right. Yeah. But it's close to a little bit of the real thing. Yeah, a little you know? bit of the real thing. But like, I didn't. Know, I thought his writing was hilarious. I thought he was hilarious, but I didn't know that he could be a cast member off of that. Right. But Lauren hired him as a writer performer, and then you just kind of realized pretty quickly. Okay. That he could do a lot of stuff. Well, when when like so, what what was your first collaboration with him? Then would you I say? think I was I wrote the very first scene that he was ever in, which was the Sabra Shopping Network, which became later <laughs> the Sabra Price Is Right with Tom Hanks, and you know it's where the Sabra Israelis are. Uh, haggling on every you know in the shopping network and then on the prices right people are guessing the prices like no 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 you know <laughs> no this is high no this is sony guts this is not don't worry about the brand name he has sony guts and then that became the zohan so it was very strange that like the very first thing okay and then and another strange thing is like this is adam doing a cartoon animal yes but his first foray into cartoon animals was something else I wrote at Saturday Night Live, a commercial called The Clucking Chicken. Clucky, and it's like a chicken mascot for a fast food chain. Yeah. And they ask, Phil Hartman asked the cartoon, like, hey, Clucky, why are you, why is your chicken so chickalicious? And he says, because I'm flame broiled. (laughs) And then he takes you through the process, but instead of like a regular commercial where you just see the flame broiling part, it's like, First, my head's cut off. <laughs> you see the cartoon head go tumbling in the air. Then I'm plucked and gutted and ready to go. <laughs> then you chew you, me up and swallow me, and I go out, come out through your digestive system. <laughs> <laughs> then he looks in a toilet and he sees Hagaga going. And oh, that was pretty. Sandler's first foray into, into animation. Um, animation. Yes. <laughs> So, um, your time in Chicago, Robert Smiley yes. here on the Rich Eisen Show, I imagine you've met many Swirsky brother types <laughs> through that. So, I went to Chicago to, like, do improv, to take uh, improv classes. Yes. But I was a huge sports fan. I, I grew up in New York, mm-hmm. as you may like be yeah, the Islander in yeah, New York. Yeah, not in Long Nets. Island, but I, I just yeah. love these teams for whatever reason. Yeah. And the logos. Sure. I have a logo thing. Look at that logo. My New York God. Nets, by the way. That's Dr. J. The only thing about being this old, Rich, is yes. that I got to watch Dr. J. <laughs> yes. And that I got to watch Walt Frazier. My kids love Walt Frazier, just the announcer. You know? Sure. Oh, of we, course. 
you know, the rhymes. Styling and beguiling. Oh, and that's a great one. And weaving and achieving. My favorite one weaving was. Weaving and achieving is their favorite. My favorite one, one of all time yes. <laughs> was when Xavier McDaniel played for the Knicks. Uh-huh. And he made a great basket and he just said, excavating. <laughs> and I'm like, what's he digging? Like, yeah. <laughs> are you digging his play? Like, or is he just, he, I think he just like wrote down a bunch of. You know what a great X one is that he says uh, words. when someone throws up an air ball, he calls it a UFO. I do, I do love Clyde, man. He oh, he's amazing. Truly one of the greats and, in the yeah, history yeah, of the yeah. entirety of New York. Oh, sports, without, the Pantheon, oh, he's, he's, you know? he's incredible. He's so incredible. you're in Chicago. and you're, I, I moved to Chicago, yeah. and I got to admit that um, I think Chicago is a greater sports town than New York. I hear you. I think the, okay, the fans are so loyal, and they have such a great sense of humor. And I noticed, like, I went to a Cub game, like, my first weekend there. Mm -hmm. And because I just had to see Wrigley Field. And I just went up to the box office, and they were like, uh, where do you want to sit? And I was like, well, just give me, what, what's the best seat? And they actually had seats by the dugout. And I'm like, that doesn't happen at Shea. Yeah. Uh, maybe it doesn't in Chicago anymore. But this was in the 80s, and yes. somehow. So I sat behind the mm -hmm. dugout, and I was, like, really excited. Tom Seaver was pitching for Cincinnati. But then I noticed the people in the bleachers are the ones who are having all the fun. Yes, you're right. They're so creative. They're doing all this stuff. Left field sucks. Yeah. Right field sucks. Yeah, taunting each other, throwing balls back. They were the. T they invented all that stuff. Yes. And they also shunned the wave, which I had a lot of respect for. Yeah. Because I would go to Shea Stadium, and the game would be tense, and some idiot would start the wave. And we're supposed to be doing the wave while, you know, it's like 4-3 in the bottom of the eighth. Yeah, right. Hey, look at this. <laughs> it's like, no, this is the game going on. Yes. And that wouldn't, the Chicago, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. No one has ever done the wave in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So anyway, then I went to Comiskey, and that's really where I noticed, like, the walrus mustaches, you know, that badge of virility that they all had. <laughs> Back in the 80s, and a lot of them still do. And, of course, there was a lot of Ditka worship. And this, and they really wore the aviator shades. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, those were not in style at that point. That was a 70s thing, but, you know. So were you the one in the writer's room or the producer's oh, room? Oh, I came up with that sketch. You did? Yeah, yeah. I wrote, We actually performed it in Chicago before. With who? Uh, with Bob Odenkirk. Mm -hmm. So Bob and I knew each other from these classes. And yes. I actually ended up bringing him to Saturday Night Live my second year, third year. But during the writer's strike of 1988, mm -hmm. we did a show in the summer. We went back to Chicago, did another sketch show. And I tried out that concept because I thought it, it'll never work on Saturday Night Live. It's too regional. So we did it on, we did it on stage and it killed. And then when Mantegna hosted two years later, Bob was like, Robert, we should try it. Come on, Robert. <laughs> and he suggested that we do it as a... Um, sports roundtable show and then i was like oh that'd be great because then they make their predictions and it's like bear 62 to three you know i'm <laughs> just very casually tossing up. really i thought that the rams might score safety too 62 to five i'm sorry i'm being a little i i, I still have faith in the bears don't worry <laughs> but uh so we tried it and it did amazing but again then i thought that's it we did it once joe Montana was the host then this local radio host, Jonathan Brandmeier, mm -hmm. in Chicago just kept playing the sketch over and over. And then he made the Bulls a catchphrase because the Bulls were, that was Michael Jordan's first year. That was it. Uh, the championship year, 1991. Mm -hmm. And so by May, George Wendt came to host and we're like, okay, let's do it again. And then and you got Mantegna back for that. No, too? no, Mantegna only did it like one more time. Okay. Then George did it that time. You know, I'm subbing in for my brother, Bill, who's had another heart attack. <laughs> and then George was the one who kept wanting to come back. <clears throat> yeah. Tanya was doing like David Mamet movies at the time. <laughs> he was like, you know, it was great. I had a good time, guys. But uh, so, but George was like, yeah, I'm a comedian. When did I, you say we got to get Farley involved? Oh, he was in the first sketch. He was in the first sketch. Oh, yeah, because he's a That's Midwesterner, so I knew he could do it. And then Mike could fake the accent. He'd spent a lot of time in Chicago. And okay. then I had written it. I had written Hartman into it. I didn't put myself in it, but Jim Downey mm -hmm. knew that I could do the accent well. And he's from Joliet. And he said, I want you to be in it because he actually thought I did the accent the best. Okay. 
And he said, you'll be the barometer. So anybody from the Midwest who's watching will hear you and that will give the sketch a level of authority and then everybody else can do their variation of it. I thought it was Har Farley pounding his chest to get his, to like give <laughs> himself CPR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Himself. well that too. Like, it's so funny because like, <laughs> so then I went back to Chicago and I would meet people and it's like, ain't no guys just like that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, look in the mirror. What are you talking about? You know guys like that. Robert Smigel here on the Rich Eisen Show. And then just before I let you go, sure. where did Triumph, the insult comic dog, come from? Where, so, where did that happen? Well, I was the first head writer at the Conan show. Conan sure. was a great friend of mine at SNL. He wanted yeah. me to be his head writer. And I was like locked in like, okay, this is it was the most thrilling job I've ever had. And I didn't want us to do anything that Letterman had done. Letterman was all about found humor, like making the stage hands do bits. Yeah. And like for Westminster, he had his joke was, oh, there's triumph. He had <laughs> his joke was to have live dogs from Westminster, just, <clears throat> excuse me, run up the aisles. Sure. You know, and, and it was very funny. But so meanwhile, I'm a newlywed at this time mm -hmm. and I go to a furniture store with my wife shopping and there's like a whimsical rack of puppets. Mm -hmm. uh, puppet heads and they're all like incredibly realistic dog and like there's also a sheep and a cat and, uh, and I laugh really hard at the realism of this and I've never seen a puppet that realistic so I quickly put a dog uh, puppet on my hand and sniff my wife's ass with it <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of the store and of course she thought it was hilarious and that's why she's still my wife <laughs> she's the perfect woman and, um, but then she surprised me. Mm -hmm. Like my birthday was like two months later. She, she brought home seven of these puppets yeah. for my birthday. And then the Westminster was happening right then. And I was like, so what if our version of this? Cause my, my mantra was, we're going to be the show that makes stuff up. Not the no found humor. Yeah. So it was like, what if we say, oh, the dogs are just getting more talented every year. And so we would have like a dog sing the theme from the bodyguard or dogs do dueling banjos. And one dog eventually like sawed another dog in half or another dog could light his own farts. Oh, the best was there was a dog who was like a Jack Nicholson impersonator. Sure. So, you know, that hacky Jack Nicholson move where the, you know, you, I'm Jack Nicholson. So we had a little dog puppet put a little paw over his forehead. I'm Jack Nicholson. They all talked with Russian accents. That was another rule that was, I set down. That's where that came from with the, the Russian accent is something I've just heard in my head since I was like a for kid. Triumph, for triumph? For dogs. For okay, dogs. For just dogs in general. I have Russian grandparents. I don't know where it came from, but I always heard <laughs> Russian accent when dogs would speak in my head and so triumph finally like four years later i just call up i wasn't even part of the show regularly yeah i just said to john groff the head writer i got can we do another one of those uh because we would do them every year uh another westminster because I, I just thought of insult comic and the whole joke is that he doesn't have any jokes he just says a compliment and then for me to poop on <laughs> and like the whole joke was on triumph and it worked really well but then we realized that he could actually make jokes and, and be kind of relief for Conan's audience. Cause Conan didn't have like a level guests. A lot of times it's like John Tesh, you know, and <laughs> the audience is like, okay, Conan's very polite. This is all very nice, but it is John Tesh. And then triumph would come on and just tear John Tesh apart. <laughs> so it was like catharsis for the audience. They were so happy. So we would do this with Hasselhoff, William Shatner, so Triumph was like the most popular character on the show well, even before he ever went on the... What did he say to remotes. Shatner? What did he do? I mean... Well, all I remember is, you know, he made fun of his acting and said, uh, you know, he imitated his acting. You know, Spock, we must do this. And then he <laughs> says, yes, that's tremendous acting for me too, Poupon. <laughs> <laughs> I know we weren't allowed to do toupee jokes. I had one and I didn't do it. It oh, was something like, oh. yeah, yeah. What's that on your hair? That looks like a Pomeranian I stooped last week. <laughs> but we passed on that one. Is a cigar like a Groucho Marx touch? Is that what the that was? The cigar was like just an old vaudeville move. Because okay. he's like a borscht belt comedian. So that's all that was. And he... The gold bow tie, Deb Shaw, the costume designer, just did that for me. She just came up with that on her own. Which person or group of people did Triumph insult the most? Oh, the, oh uh, the definitely Michael? 
like Star Wars yeah. type nerds and Comic Con <laughs> nerds. That's always the most fun. That's because... you pissed off the most. Like really? No, no, like no. Really... They're not pissed off. That's the joy. I, okay. I like it better when people aren't pissed off. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sometimes too. it's better television yeah. when they are. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but for me. I like when people are kind of like able to laugh at themselves and I don't have to feel bad. So they're all <laughs> lining up. They're all lining up. The Star Wars nerds who were online for Star Wars, they were like, I was like Don Rickles to them. Like, like please like, insult me. Yes. Like when I met Don Rickles at the Conan show, it was like thrilling. Yeah. You know, sure. and he just, you know, of course he, everybody who meets him, he has an insult for because he knows that's what they want. So he looked at me and he said, hello, rabbi. <laughs> Which then I heard later was the first thing he ever said to John Stewart too. Oh, perfect! So he's got he's got a little bit of a, oh, a bag of tricks. Oh my thing, right? gosh, <laughs> Robert, this is just an absolute pleasure to have you back on here. Everybody, check out Leo on Netflix right here on the Roku platform. Be part of the millions, enjoying it with your family as well. Uh, good to see you, brother. Great seeing you. Catch the Rich Eisen show every single day on the Roku channel, twelve to three Eastern, for free. 